and I saw in medical school um, by Thomas Edison. It said the doctor to the future will give no medicine, but instead will interest his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And one of Thomas's brighter ideas. And when I saw this quote in medical school, I just passed it right on by. <clears throat> I, was, I went to the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago, and I was so into becoming a real doctor, who, and real doctors do real doctor things. They deliver babies, they fix broken arms, they sew up lacerations, that's what real doctors do. And diet was boring stuff, and nutrition, yeah. You send them down to the, dietetic, the dietician, and they figure out a 2,000 calorie diet, and don't bother me. And that's how I practiced medicine for the first eight or ten years of my career. Well, I have soon, or I have late, uh, come to realize how important what we eat really is in the creation and prevention of so many of the diseases that we see today. And I'll tell you how I came to those realizations. Now, the North American diet has changed. This is not going to be a technical lecture, but I did want to show you this one graph because there's some very significant lines here. The two top lines, the lavender line and the yellow line, are the amount of plant-based foods that are consumed in the United States and in Canada as well. And this is back in 1909. You can see we were eating a lot of grain products. We were eating almost 300 pounds of, um, of wheat and barley and other grain products and almost 200 pounds of potatoes a year. Look what happened in the intervening 85 years. Our consumption of, of uh, wheat and grain products have fallen to half of their 1909 level and our potato consumption has fallen to half of their 1909 level. Look what happened to the amount of flesh foods that we are eating. The amount of milk we consume has more than doubled, our beef consumption has gone up by 50% and our chicken consumption has gone up by 280%. We are eating a tremendous amount of animal flesh and we have essentially exchanged a plant-based diet for a meat-based diet and the results have been just disastrous for both our health and the environment. Consider how much animal flesh uh, most North Americans eat. In their lifetime, the average meat-eating American is going to eat 15 cows, oh, <laughs> going to eat 24 hogs, the 12 sheep. She will eat 900 chickens and 1,000 pounds of assorted animals that either swam in the water or flew in the air. That is a tremendous amount of animal flesh to be pouring through the human bloodstream year after year. No wonder we wind up with clogged arteries and high blood pressure and cancers and a lot of other diseases, and I'll show you how those two are related. Let's talk about the health effects of an animal-based diet. Here it is, the great American dietary catastrophe in all its glory. I grew up thinking this is good food. What's for lunch, Mom? Oh, I got something good for you, son, she'd say. And she would give me some food like this. And my mother didn't know, and your mother didn't know. Uh, they didn't know that the uh, sausages and the eggs and the ham were just loaded with fat and cholesterol. And this is a coronary artery thrombosis waiting for some place to happen. Now, what is the effect on your body when you eat food like this? Well, the effect was brought out very dramatically uh, to me about 10 years ago. I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service. That's the service that deals with people's hearts and blood vessels. And like all good anesthesia residents, I was making my rounds one evening to see my patients for next morning surgery. And the last patient I was seeing, I pulled back the curtain and there was Mr. Phillips. Nice fella, but he was just huge. He weighed 290 pounds and he was booked for a four-vessel coronary artery bypass procedure. Um, he weighed 290 pounds, 290 was also his systolic blood pressure, it was also his cholesterol level, it was also his blood sugar level. I called him Mr. 290, nice guy, uh, but really clogged up in his arteries. And because it was late at night, it was too late to call the blood drawing technician up to draw his blood test, I drew his, his preoperative blood work into a glass tube and I put it out at the nurse's station and later I came by to pick up the blood tube and take it down to the laboratory and when I looked at the tube of blood I couldn't believe my eyes. When you draw blood into a glass tube and let it sit there for an hour it separates out into two parts and the red clot settles to the bottom and the liquid part of the blood, the serum, rises up to the top. Here you see two tubes of blood and the tube on the left is normal, serum, is normal blood. Here you see the dark red clot and this golden yellow liquid, this is normal serum. This is what your blood is supposed to look like. But I looked at Mr. Phillips' tube and it was just shocking. 
The serum floating in his tube was thick and greasy white. It looked like Elmer's glue. It stuck to the sides of the tube when I shook it. I went back into the room. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a double cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized what I was looking at was all the fat in the beef burger and the butter fat and the cheese and the butter fat and the ice cream and the butter fat and the milk had oozed out into his blood and turned his blood fat. It's a well-known clinical phenomenon. It's called lipemia, and it happens every time you eat a fatty meal, you turn your blood fatty. And your blood stays this way for four hours until your liver can clear it out of the bloodstream. If you are like most North Americans and eat bacon and eggs for breakfast and a cheeseburger for lunch and fried chicken for dinner and ice cream for dessert, you're keeping your blood fatty all day. The stuff never clears out of the bloodstream. You keep your blood fatty for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. What do you think is going to happen to the arteries carrying all that fat? I will show you what happens to the arteries carrying all that fat in a few minutes. But it's a disaster. There's a lot of fat in the North American diet, and it's hidden in most foods. You can see the fat around a T-bone steak, but most of the fat is in the muscle of the animal, and it's hidden in the dairy products. And, and uh, most of the folks who present food to us don't want us to think about the fat, especially the fast food industry. They really don't want you to think about how much fat is in their burgers and hot dogs, uh, except one chain of fast food restaurants in Los Angeles. There is one burger chain that is very forthright about the reality of the fat content of their diet, and they come right out and tell you, uh, clearly on their marquee, um, about, uh, about the product that they're selling. Now, if you stood outside the exit door of this restaurant or McDonald's or any other fast food restaurant where people are shoveling in their cheeseburgers, if you stood at the exit door with a needle and a syringe in your hand and drew blood on the people walking out the exit door, what you would see is most of the blood would be as fatty as Mr. Phillips' blood tube. Now, they're all in there making the blood fatty. If you ever have a big cheese pizza and a bowl of ice cream afterwards and you feel a little greasy on the inside, it's because you really are. You really, you really go greasy on the inside. Animal fat comes in three flavors in the North American diet. It comes in the form of red meat, and the fat is in the meat. It is in the fibers of the animal's muscle, and just trimming off the white fat around the edge of the steak really does not lower the fat and cholesterol content significantly of the meat. So red meat is the number one source of fat and cholesterol in the North American diet. The second is the yolk of hen's eggs. The egg of a chicken is meant to hatch baby chicks. And it, the yolk of the hen's egg is one of the most concentrated globs of fat and cholesterol on the planet. It is made to power that baby chicken for 21 days with no other energy. And when you run egg yolks through your bloodstream, you turn your blood fatty, just like Mr. Phillips. And the third source of fat in the North American diet comes from that white fluid that comes out of the udder of a cow. Now, cow's milk is a high-fat fluid exquisitely designed for turning a 65-pound calf into a 400-pound cow in a year. That is what cow's milk is for. Now, the it's a, it, whole milk has a butterfat content of 3%. That's the cream that rises up to the top. And you eat, you drink a 3% solution of butterfat, you're going to turn your blood fatty, as will a 2 and 1% solution of butterfat. But at the dairy, the butter fat is skimmed off and they concentrate it into huge vats, half the size of this room. And they concentrate the fat to 50, 60, 80, 90 percent fat. This stuff is so thick you can walk across it. Why do they do that? Well, they do that so you will buy it and eat it. Uh, the butter fat is mixed up with uh, air until it hardens into chunks called butter. The butter fat is uh, mixed with sugar and frozen and sold as ice cream. The butter fat is mixed up with cocoa powder and uh, sugar and sold as milk chocolate. The butter fat is mixed up with bacteria and allowed to ferment until it turns into sour cream. A lower fat version is called yogurt. And the butter fat is mixed up with calf's stomach and, uh, and bacteria and allowed to ferment for about six weeks till it hardens into chunks called cheese. These are all forms of butter fat. The folks at the dairy want you to buy the butter fat and eat it. And when you do, you turn your blood fat. There's absolutely no reason to run butter fat through your bloodstream at any time, and I'm submitting to you that you'll be a lot healthier and happier if you do not. Cow's milk is for baby calves. You have no more need of cow's milk than you need giraffe milk or horse milk or rat milk.